And we're back with the Good Green Home Show. And with us today, we have a very special guest. This young man needs no introduction. He's been on the show before, but we will introduce Mr. Mark Blasky. Mm -hmm. Mark is a beekeeper and a honey producer. Yep. Well, his bees do the work. They produce the honey. <laughs> I grab the honey. Yeah. And yeah. in 2013, Mark was honored by the Indiana Beekeepers Association as the Young Beekeeper of the Year Award winner, wow. which is quite an honor, wow. Mark. Okay, yeah. I, I have to ask, how old are you? I'm 22 now. 22 yep. and a world famous beekeeper. Yes, <laughs> I would like to think so. Yeah, we've had a guest on this show before, Professor Doug Tellamy from the University of Delaware, who is mm -hmm. one of the leading experts in the world on the monarch mm -hmm. butterfly. And when I asked Mark to do the show and I said, you know, I wonder if you know this famous entomologist, Doug yeah. Tellamy. And he said, oh, my gosh, I've emailed that guy questions before. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you had him on the show. He so Mark cool. is a true bug expert. It's it's in his mm -hmm. blood, not in a bad way. He is a bug man. And just like I'm a plant man, you're you're the bug man. Yes. So are you definitively an entomologist? I am not like a certified entomologist. Okay. Yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be, you have plenty of time for that. Yeah. Yeah. What Definitely. are you going to school for, Mark? Right now I'm going for biology. Okay. So Mark's a biology major. Where are you going to school? IUN out in Gary. Okay. okay. Indiana University. It's a yep. very good school. Mm -hmm. And yep. you're learning about biology but your specific interest is entomology. Mm -hmm. And what got you interested in entomology or the study of insects? When I was younger, I would always be outside and I would see like the ants building their mm -hmm. ant hills. So I just thought they were really awesome from that point on. And I had an art teacher in grade school who bought praying mantis egg cases and hatched oh, them neat. out. Oh, neat, I love that. Wow. So yeah, that's fun. when we did that, that was that was the bit beginning. <laughs> and and from that point on, all you could think about were bugs. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so praying mantis eggs hatching, what is that like? It's actually the the female mantis lays a big thing about the size of a walnut. Wow. And inside there, there's 50 to a couple hundred baby praying mantises. Wow. And they repel down out of the front of the egg. They, there's like a zipper on the front and it opens up and the mantids crawl down like and like That's they're so awesome like okay, a mountain climber wait this is actually a great show topic because um praying mantis are now put into you can order them yep. for your garden really so, yes what is their function like ladybugs you can they eat all sorts of bad insects the japanese beetles they oh. they eat aphids when they're younger mm -hmm. so they don't of, mess with the good stuff though they're kind of a predator for the bad insects yeah they eat bad insects mm -hmm. they they'll eat whatever gets in front of them so they will eat like a bee occasionally but if you can catch them yeah if you can catch them <laughs> Yeah. But the, the benefit to your garden is huge because yeah. this is organic. You know, it's all natural. You don't have to use chemicals to control your insects. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. And Instead, praying mantis are native to what part of the country? They're actually, there's a bunch of different species that are native to the, the United Midwest. States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a Carolina mantid, but a lot of the praying mantises you would find now, the big ones that you see outside in the fall, those are called the Chinese mantis. Oh, and they're they huge. imported them. They are not native. They are not mm -hmm. native, but they will take care of the bad insects. Are they messing around. with the ecosystem in any way? Not particularly that I've been seeing. Okay. Well, so that's a good you sign. always hear yeah. about them introducing a non-native species whether it's a fish an insect a plant a and ladybug sometimes a ladybug we have those sometimes it goes awry orange, uh, in the chicagoland area where i live i yeah. no longer have red ladybugs we only have these horrible orange ladybugs i mean all creatures are lovely. And yet these guys bite me once in a while. Shauna, so I think I'm, the orange ladybugs are being gonna be very offended by that. I comment. know, right? <laughs> Morally. But it's the bite, they bite me. And yeah. that never happened before with a red ladybug. They were sweet, you know, and the orange ones, they kinda of, but so the still red ladybugs are, are gone completely from the Midwest. I don't think so. They they're not completely gone, they're just outnumbered. Yeah. by a, a lot. So the orange ones are more aggressive. So the orange ones attack the red and um, I don't think they distinguish. Do they eat the aphids though? Cause I know ladybugs yes. are a big aphid and aphids are mm -hmm. a, a bug that's notorious for killing plants. What they, what the 
the orange ladybugs do is they compete with the with the red ones, and the mm-hmm. red ones get out competed. They're too mm-hmm. delicate. Yeah. Now, here's the other cool thing, though, about ladybugs. Uh, my grandmother used to have a shrub, and it was always covered in ladybugs. And uh, she w- she at the time thought it was a horrible thing, and she needed to get rid of her ladybugs. But oh, in no. fact, that's a good thing because it means that there's a lot of aphids or something there that mm-hmm. they love to eat, and they're taking care of the problem for Lady you. Ladybugs are mm-hmm. our friends. They absolutely. Yes. So, yeah. Mark, we're talking about ladybugs. We're talking about praying mantis. Mm-hmm. What's how do you pronounce the plural form of praying mantis? Praying mantid. Praying mantid. Yes. I heard you say there's a Carolina mantid earlier in the conversation, <laughs> yes. and, it, and I that clicked in. I was wondering if either you misspoke or that was the plural yeah. form. So, the, so there, there's mantids instead of mantises, but mantises is easier to say. Well, I'm glad we have an expert who knows what they're talking about when it comes to the subject of entomology, because I would have never known that unless I took the time to look it up online. But it, Mark yep. really knows. So Mark, your real hobby, your real interest, your real love is the honeybee. Is that correct? Yes. Honeybee and bumblebee. And bumblebee. Yes. I know Mark has <laughs> talked to me before about some of the things, some of the work he's actually done with the bumblebee. Mm-hmm. Pretty neat stuff. Mm-hmm. Why don't you tell the <laughs> listeners and viewers about your experiments with the bumblebee? Ooh. Okay. With the bumblebee, they have a lot of predators out there. Mm-hmm. And the number one predator is the wax moth. And the wax moth will get inside the bumblebee nest and lay its eggs. And uh, when those eggs hatch, they turn into little wax worms. You can buy them for fishing. A lot of people oh, use them for fishing. fishing. So they, the little wax worms crawl through the bumblebee nest and eat everything. Even oh. the baby bees, they'll oh. eat the wax. So the entire nest will be webbed up. And they they can't get rid of them because they hide underneath the nest. Are and, they native insects, or are they were they brought in from somewhere accidentally or on purpose? I believe they came in accidentally on different shipments of wax, and when the honeybee was introduced to North America, that's so where they came from. Do they attack both honeybees and bumblebees? Yes, Ooh. but the honeybees have enough guards in a big enough colony and they've been living with them long enough mm-hmm. to know how to defeat them huh. but it's, it's like the lord of the rings going on it's war <laughs> out there Mark's it bee is. Boxes. <laughs> so this was the big problem the bumblebee nests were getting completely destroyed oh, and no. out of t- 20 nests you would have maybe one or two that make it to the end of the season so some Ooh. friends in germany they're way ahead when it comes to insect stuff. Mm-hmm. They design boxes that have a door flap on the front, almost like a doggy door. Oh. And the bumblebees learn how to use the doggy door to get in and out. And what happens is the wax moths aren't strong enough, nor do they know how to lift the door to get in. That's genius. So it's a doggy door. Figured out how to lift a doggy door yes. flap. Yes. What you what you do is when you first start them That's out. That's awesome. You lower the door a little bit each day, and they learn to push their head up to get open the door to oh. get out. You know what I love about that the most, uh, outside of the obvious that that's mind blowing that they figured <laughs> it out, is that's an organic solution. You don't have to use a chemical yes, to get rid of them exactly. because the chemical can harm the bee. Yep. Well, it, they're doing it on their own. They're, they're just saying hey, we're going to go but through this door flap. The bad news, though, is that there's a lot of things they cannot defend against right now. And, yes. you know, you we've all heard that the bumblebees and the regular the honeybees are under crisis. Uh, my concern is, and what people tend to forget, they're like, eh, it's just a bee. What makes a difference? What yeah. makes a difference is this is our food source. We have bees that are actually pollinating the majority of the, the produce in the United States. Without the bees, we're in big trouble. Yep. One third of the food supply comes directly through pollination. Almonds, mm-hmm. walnuts, you've got apples. Now, California would pretty much fall off not just because of the fault line, but their economy would <laughs> the be fruit. destroyed yes. because yes. of the walnut industry. And there's so many things well, that... Well, even with like tomatoes, for instance, are self-pollinating. 
or so they say. However, um, mm -hmm. the bees do this thing where they come in and they like the flowers of the tomato also. And um, what do you know the term? Yes, it's called buzz pollination. And, and it's, it's when they bee. shake their mm -hmm. little bottoms and bodies against the flower, then it drops the pollen, the pollen mm -hmm. down to the next flower. And so they're still important, even for oh, tomatoes absolutely. and other plants yes. that wouldn't be considered traditional pollinating plants. Yes, that that what you spoke of is a lot a big bumblebee thing, mm. and it's they have muscles inside their bellies, like their abs, pretty much, mm -hmm. and they vibrate them because uh, the tomato flower is a cone, like yes. a cone shape. They bite onto the cone and knock the pollen down out of the cone, and it pollinates the That's so flower. So cool! Wow. So <laughs> I know we spoke before the show, and you had some sad news for us for your own personal beehives and I'd like you to explain to the listeners and viewers a little bit about what's going on with your honeybee population that you are maintaining. All right well this past winter was pretty bad we lost at least half of our bees. Oh, they and they had the it was what's interesting is the biggest and strongest hives are actually the ones that are that ended up dead. They have too many bees to where they eat all of their food and starve to death. Oh. Whoa. So a so, lot of my big hives are dead now. So is that a common problem in nature where they were they will overbreed themselves? Yeah. I, I have heard of a lot of reasons why <clears throat> bees well, have the, died off, but that's not one I've ever heard no, before. No, yeah. the they have the mites. That's the, the number one thing mite. I've heard, the parasitic yep. mite that's come in and devastates the entire hive. Uh, but this is something I've not yes. heard of before. What what they do a lot nowadays is the honeybees. When you when you start beekeeping, you'll get a package of bees. They will send you pounds of bees in the mail, and those bees come from California. They and, flew all the way from California, <laughs> and boy, are their wings tired. <clears throat> so what ends up happening is you have bees that are used to a California climate, mm. oh. living in a cold climate. So it takes a lot of breeding to get the right genetics. A lot of it's genetics, we've, we're finding out. So can you buy local bees? Yes. Is there a way where you can say, you know what, I live in Iowa, I want some Iowa bees, baby. Yes. I don't want none of this California bee stuff. Yes, you can get your local bees, but the why it's so convenient, most of them come from California is, they have an early spring. Their mm. spring starts in February. So you'll end up getting your bee packages in April, right when spring starts here. So if you were to get your local bees, you'd have them in maybe June. You have to wait a little longer. So you, you get a late start. So that's wow. why they import or ship them across country. Gotcha. But then there's a, obviously there's a consequence to that. It all goes back to buying local. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. You need Pretty to buy a local Great point, once again. Absolutely. Yep. So what's going on with your bees now? You you lost some of them because of overpopulation. What else is going on? Well, a lot of times they will have, like you said, the varroa mite. Mm -hmm. The varroa mite, usually when a hive has varroa mites, it's dead the beginning of fall. Oh. So a lot of a lot of hives drop off really mm -hmm. quick in the early part of the winter. So I've had Last fall, I had that happen. I had about three or four, about about three drop off because of mites alone. Oh. Wow. How many hives do you maintain, Mark? This year was the biggest amount of hives. I have the largest number of hives. I had eight, which isn't a very many, but because there's a lot of people locally who have 30 or so. Yeah, but for well, one man, you're, you're yeah. not yeah, one exactly, man shop. <laughs> right, you're not exactly in the mass production honey business. Yeah. Mark's a biology student who has a love yes. for doing this. And yeah, it'd be great if more people became casual or hobby beekeepers. Mm -hmm. I know at our garden centers at Alsip Nursery, we are carrying now the bee keeping kits, the yes. startup kits, the, the boxes, and the accessories, which we're very excited about. You can purchase them online at alsip.com. More people need a source or a resource other than just buying them online. They need a local place they can go to to talk to somebody who's an actual expert yes. because you can do all your research in the world online, but to talk to somebody with the real life experience <clears throat> of doing a hobby like that yes. is much more valuable in my mind than reading some something online and some 
rude comments following the thread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens a lot. You'll have a lot of brand new beekeepers come into it and they're overwhelmed mm. because they've been reading books and online, which is great for lear starting out, but it's better to have someone that is actively keeping in your area even. A mentor. Yes, mm -hmm. from area to area, it's different. You'll read in a book that someone overwinters a hive with 60 pounds of honey on it. Well, maybe in your area, they need 120 pounds. So it makes a big difference. It's a big, yeah. it's a big deal. You can't just copy one person and it works all the time. Mm. So that's what a lot of new people try. So oh. there's online social networks, but yes. Mark, you're involved in a local in-person social network with other beekeepers. Yes. And I would assume that there are associations like that throughout the United all States. Over. Yep. How does somebody find out and join and you know what are the benefits of becoming a part of a group like that if you're serious about beekeeping? The, that's the best way to start. That's how I got started. I read a lot and I found a local beekeeping group. So okay. you would look up your area, your county, your section of the state like ours. Our local one here is the Northwest Indiana Beekeeping Association. That's the one I'm a part of. And uh, there's a lot of people in there, very knowledgeable. They've been keeping for 40 years. So it's kind of like a community and everybody's trying to help one another. Yes. I'm interested in learning uh, the, the viewer at home or the listener at home, how they can grow plants that yes. would support the bee. So Great. what plants yes. do you Absolutely. recommend that, uh, let's say you don't want to be a beekeeper and yet you want to support the bees. Yes. One of, one of the best ways to actually help the bees is plant bee plants. Cause this is how Mark and I met by the way. Yes. <laughs> Over he bee came plants. in for a job at the garden center because he learned so much about perennials and pollinators. Yes. I knew all okay. of the pollinators, what bees liked, what they didn't. And You're the bee man. I, yeah. I saw him, this was a few years ago and he was looking younger than he does now. And I said, <laughs> Who is this kid and how the heck does he know so much about, about plants? Bees. I was yeah, yeah. I, and I grilled you. You remember that? Yeah, I, I remember. I, I sat there and I was firing fastball <laughs> questions oh, at him. My going, goodness. I'm like, I'm very skeptical all right, so of let's his see. knowledge, but he knew he knew his stuff. Right so, now. Mark, I think we can all agree that the bees are in trouble. There are a lot of differing opinions on what the actual cause of the decline of the honeybee. Yes. Everybody agrees that they're in trouble and everybody also agrees that they're very important. You mentioned the plants that people can plant to help save the bees. Mm -hmm. What else? We've got 30 seconds. What do you want the listeners and viewers to know that they can do to do their part to help save the bees? One of the things is support local beekeepers. You buy honey from someone down the street mm -hmm. instead of from the store because the store Absolutely. honey is imported from all over the world and a lot of that is questionable. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing, that's a big debate. And as far as anything else, be careful with what you spray. Don't spray anything on flowers. Mm -mm. That's a big deal. No chemicals in your garden. Yes. Well, all very right. good, Mark. Well, thank you very much. Mark Blasky, 2013, a few years ago now, a couple years back, yes. Indiana Young Beekeeper of the Year Award. He's not a young man anymore. He's very <laughs> experienced. This guy is doing a lot to save the bees. And thank you very much, Mark. No problem. It's great luck having to you. you. In, uh -huh. uh, with your biology degree, and I think you're going to do great things in life. All righty. Well, next on the Good Green Home Show, we have more on home and gardening, all with the green theme. Rich and Shauna will be right back. Mm Think outside the box store. 
Do you want to stop garden insects before they become a problem? Bonite All Seasons Horticultural Spray is your answer and will stop your garden insects before they hatch. Early spring smothers most insect eggs left behind by last year's plant-destroying insects. Bonite's All Season Horticultural Spray Oil will destroy insect eggs in early spring and if used throughout the season, will control all stages of insects. Bonite All Season Spray Oil is recommended for use on shade trees, fruit trees, shrubs, roses, and ornamental plants. Bonite all Seasons Horticultural Spray Oil is easy to use and an all-natural product that can be used all season long. Bonide products are family made in America. All Seasons Horticultural Spray Oil is available at your local hardware store, garden center, or farm feed store, or go to bonide.com for a retailer near you.